Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to Coffee with a Codex. Uh, welcome back if you've been here before. If this is your first meeting, you are also very welcome. Um, my name is Dot Porter, and I am a curator in the Kislak Center for Special Collections, Rare Books, and Manuscripts at the University of Pennsylvania Libraries. And um, this is our weekly visit with one of our manuscripts. So once a week, um, either myself or one of my colleagues takes a book uh, off the shelf and we share it with you. Sometimes these are books that we know a lot about and sometimes they aren't. And this one is one that I'm not sure I've looked at before uh, today, uh, but I think it's it's neat. So we'll take a look. Before I forget though, uh, let me drop the links in the chat. Um, let's see. So the first link is going to be a link to the catalog record and from there you can access a um a digital copy so if you want to look at the uh trend at the images as we go along um and then uh there's information on our next two weeks meetings i'll be back next week nick herman is going to be here on the 31st um oh no i'll be here the next two weeks and then nick will be here on the 31st which is i guess three weeks from now a um, couple other things. Uh, apologies, particularly to Bran, <laughs> because I had I had said that we are going to be moving to Monday starting in September, but um, I I got a fellowship, which is great uh, through the Price Lab for Digital Humanities um, for the next year, which is good news for me, but. I, I realized this week that we're going to be having biweekly meetings on Mondays at noon. So I have to go to these lunch meetings every other Monday. So instead, we're going to be moving to Tuesday, uh, starting in September. Uh, so apologies for that, but you'll, you're going to start seeing the announcements as we move, as we move forward. Um, link to our YouTube playlist. Uh, we're going to keep recording these, obviously. So if Tuesday doesn't work for you, you can still come and watch the recordings uh, and then a link to the schedule and to the mailing list if you're not already on there. Okay, that's all of that uh, going on. And maybe Amy, can you copy and paste those? Because I've heard people coming in a couple times since I started. So now we're going to turn to uh, this manuscript. It doesn't look like much um, because the binding is obviously not this is not an original binding. Uh, the binding is modern. In, in the record, it says modern crimson half Morocco. So modern, this probably means 20th century, although modern sometimes means um, even older than that. And the half Morocco is this half, this leather that's sort of covering the spine and the edges here. Um, so that's how that terminology works. And then I'll just show you the spine. It's not great. It's kind of coming apart. You can see on the, the edge there. Um, but it is okay. So the manuscript itself, I'm trying to get, let me get myself together so I can see both the both of these. Um, let's see. Uh, all right. So the manuscript is a copy of William of Ockham's uh, Sum of Logic, or Soma Totius um, Logicae, and it's a textbook on logic. It was written um, by him in probably the early 14th century. Uh, he died in approximately 1349. Uh, this manuscript was written in the second half of the 14th century, so between 1350 and 1399. We don't have an exact date. The dating is based on the, um, the script, um, mostly, of, of the writing. So this is what this is what it looks like. We have um, two columns per page. Um, we have uh, small initials. Um, each one of these initials is the beginning of a new chapter. So I'll talk in a minute about the structure of the of the text. There's also a little bit of decoration. So it's not a very heavily decorated manuscript. The first page has the most decoration and it's not, you know, I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see better. It's not, not real fancy, right? Um, this is not a fine artist, but they did their best. Um, 
we have a uh, some kind of um, family crest here, and we have a couple of inhabited initials with little faces. I think these are the only ones that have uh, faces, although there are a couple of other sort of colorful illuminated initials um, in there, but they all have sort of the same kind of look to them. So they're not, this is not a real fancy manuscript. It's, you know, um, it's a logic textbook. So you wouldn't necessarily expect it to be very, uh, very fancy, but it's nice that it's got this little bit of, of um, writing there. So um, maybe written in Bologna, I don't know how that was, how that was determined, but it's definitely Italian 14th century um, logic text. So the, the, the book, The Sum of Logic, um, I say book, the work, The Sum of Logic is divided into four books. Um, book one is on terms, book two is on prepositions, book three on syllogisms, and um, I don't know. This, so it, the work is, is in three books. This is in four books. Our book apparently is in four books, but sometimes this happens. Um, if you remember a few weeks ago, we were looking at um, Isidore of Seville and Isidore of Seville's work, his encyclopedic work has 20 books and our copy has 21 books because the scribe divided one of the books into two. And so this happens sometimes um, that as scribes are writing and as copies are made, um, the, the works themselves sort of get divided up into different, um, into different uh, ways. But we start out with um, on terms and the way that the, uh, scribes let us know where we are in the work is things that you will have seen before if you've if you've looked at manuscripts and if you've um if you've visited us here across the top we have a um sort of chapter headings so this is the book on terminorum and so at the top we have terminorum here and then the chapters in the books are short. Oop. So there's a chapter that starts over here um, and they are numbered. I think this is chapter three and then this is chapter four. One of the things that I found kind of interesting and each chapter begins with a, um, with a little colored initial, either blue or red. They're not consistently, um, going back and forth between uh, blue and red. So here's a, that's red. Um, so here's a blue followed by a blue. Um, and then we have another blue one and then a red one. So it's not, sometimes they're consistently red, blue, red, blue. This one, not so much. Um, let's see. And what else can we see? So structurally, if we look at the parchments, um, the parchment, I don't know what kind of animal it's made from, but whatever kind of animal it is, it has a lot of hair follicles. So if we look at this, this is um, on part, so parchment is made from animal skin um, and animal skin has a flesh side, which is the side of the animal that's sort of facing inside the animal. And then the hair side, which is the outside where the hair grows. and Sometimes you can tell, you can really tell which is hair and which is flesh. So here we have the flesh side and then here's the hair side and that's what's happening here. All of this little, these little black dots, that's not dirt, this isn't dirty. This is just where there was hair growing up out of, um, out of the skin of the animal. And so that um, is maintained and you, you can see it too at the top. Um, there's sort of larger, larger follicles there. So the parchment is not the best parchment. The best parchment 
sometimes you can't even tell which is the hair side and which is the flush side um, because it's so well prepared that the that the uh, hair follicles are just uh, completely gone. So we're in uh, in the terms. So I I am not a um, an expert in medieval philosophy uh, at all, uh, but I looked a little bit into Occam and what this text is about. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit. If anyone else here knows more, please feel free to speak up. Um, but Occam, you may have heard of Occam, if for anything else, because of the Occam's razor, which I believe is the idea that the simplest, it's sort of like the simplest answer is, is the one. So it's not, don't be too complicated. The simplest answer is, the, is gonna be the correct one. Um, he was a um, philosopher who was, I guess, who believed in the nom something called nominalism, which is this idea that concepts don't exist. They only exist in the words that we use to describe them. So um, these, this work um, with books on terms and books on propositions, he would say that it's very important to like define your words and how you use them um, because that is what reality is, is, is actually the words that we use to describe it. If this is my understanding of, of how it works. So it's, so it's really complicated and very interesting. And I feel like it, um, it is interesting um, thinking back a couple of weeks ago, we, when we looked at, again, at um, Isidore of Seville, because Isidore of Seville's work is, is about the importance of um, you know, terms to describe things. And so he goes into a lot of detail about how you decide which words um, or where words come from, like the history of words. So I feel like every week I understand a little bit more about um, how medieval people, or at least medieval like thinkers, uh, thought about about things. Um, and it's also worth mentioning that that like Isidore and other medieval thinkers, um, William of Ockham wasn't he wasn't like making things up from whole cloth. So he cites Boethius and he cites Aristotle and he cites these classical thinkers and he, I think, positions himself as being an extension um, of of them. So I've just sort of been paging through as I've been talking. And we can see, you've probably been noticing the hair and the flesh side, um, the flesh side versus the hair side. There's also um, some uh, marginal notes that I've been seeing. So added notes in the margins, maybe some glosses up here. Um, and over here, I think this is uh, an error that's been uh, that's been fixed. So this manuscript apparently uh, was written by several different people. <coughs> so if we took a look, we would see that there are different, what we call hands, different scribal hands um, that are represented here. And I haven't looked closely at that, um, but we can see here's, here is a chapter Heading. So the chapter numbers are written in red. Sometimes they're written out in the margin like here. And sometimes I think you can see this one is written sort of in line uh, and when, there's, when there's space there. So that's how we know um, where we're going. Let me see. There's no, before, before we started, I was talking to Amy Hutchins, who's our manuscript cataloger about the record for this, and if you take a look at the record, you'll see there's not a whole lot there. Um, so there's no in, there's no notes about where the books start or how many chapters there are, or the how many exactly hands there are. So there's still a lot of work to be done here. Um, but we have there are some manicules in the bottom margin as you're oh, going through. One. Yeah. Let's let me zoom in here. So manicules are these little hands. They're usually hands. They're not always hands, um, but they're little hands that are sort of pointing out important 
important thing. So I think what's probably going on here is that this goes here. So you have the two little hands. Do you think that's right, Amy? That maybe there's a, a it's a note or maybe an, uh, maybe because it does look like that note is in a hand, in the hand of the text, which mm -hmm. other notes are not. Yeah, um, I, I'm not. I don't think this one is in the same no, hand. At least the I wouldn't ink, say so. The ink is different. Yeah. Um, and if you go back so, another page, I think there's another manicule with a longer note that looks like it's more of a reader's note. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, yeah. So this is a this is again a different hand, and he's got a little extension, little red. Oh, there's a little bit of red there. Um, added. Yeah. So this is as a textbook. It isn't surprising that there are um, marginal notes that have been that have been added by other people, although not, I think, very much later. I haven't seen um, sometimes in in older manuscripts, you'll see um, you know, notes added that are clearly like 17th, you know, 17th century or 16th century. But I think these are are pretty much within the sort of time. Okay. Uh, is that this? a cat? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is a catchword uh, here. And so most of you, uh, I'm sure, know the catchword is um, put at the end of a choir, a choir being um, a gathering of, of sheets folded. So this is the end of one of these gatherings. Um, and what they what the scribe will do is will write the first word of the next choir at um, at the bottom. Sometimes like this in the middle. Sometimes on the side. Sometimes they go um, sort of vertically instead of horizontally. Um, and that's to help the person who does the binding, so they know what order the choirs go in. Uh, and sometimes they're decorated. And these, um, I think, every choir in this manuscript has a catchword and they're all they all have this sort of little decoration around them this isn't very fancy sometimes they're fancier but again it's a logic textbook so you wouldn't expect it to be to be too fancy um but it's still pretty neat so let's go let's go forward a little bit um so we've we've actually i think we've moved from terms where did terms Term, terminorum, and I've been looking at, let's see, and here's terminorum at the top, and let's see, the next one should be propositions, but that doesn't look like propositions to me, and I'm wondering if it may have gotten out of order. Um, and again, the record isn't gonna help us, or maybe we're still in Terminorum and they're just, no, here we are Terminorum again. So maybe for some reason, the they're using a different, a different title. So I'm seeing some questions. So Heidi wants to know, does the use of catchword on choirs suggest the work of multiple scribes on the manuscript? So uh, no. Um, you see catchwords in manuscripts that were written all by one scribe. It's really, um, it's used as a, as a guide for the, for the binder. So some, sometimes you see them and sometimes you don't, but, um, but it doesn't really say anything about uh, if you have multiple scribes, although it would be, I mean, it, that might be something to look into because it would, it might make sense that if you have, if you have a manuscript where multiple people are writing it sometimes not always you they are working by choir particularly if they're copying another manuscript they might be working by choir um so it might be interesting to see if you're more likely to see catchwords on manuscripts that were written choir by choir by multiple scribes um but in but i don't i don't know that might be interesting to uh look about let's see and Jana asks, any idea where the manuscript was used and was it actually used as a textbook or was it from the library of the person whose coat of arms is on the first folio? So these are great questions. Um, let me take a quick look at the record again, because I don't think we have a lot of information. 
um, the provenance we have is that we, Penn bought it from a bookseller in Florence in 1907. So that's how Penn got the manuscript. And there's not really, uh, as far as I can tell, there's nothing known before that. And I think the, it's, there's nothing in the record about who's, who that, who that is, um, who owned it before that, um, at least not that I'm seeing. So let me, let me go back and look at your question again, where the manuscript is used. So if it was written in um, Bologna, it could have been at the university. Maybe that's, maybe that's even th the thinking behind of the, the location, because there is a university there. And so it would make sense that a the book was written at it. So Occam wrote the text as a textbook. It was designed to be a text that you would read to learn about logic. Um, so it, it could, was it actually used as a textbook that there are notes that, that, so here's what, here's another one here that somebody came through and wrote notes in the margins later, I think implies to me that it, that it was used in a textbook in the sense that somebody was reading the text and absorbing it and, you know, making, writing their own ideas about it, or, or I'm assuming that's what that is. Um, so it was being used as a textbook, but it could be that the person who owned it was a rich person who was a student at the university, or maybe not. Like it's sort of, you sort of, use what you can figure out from looking at the book to kind of piece together um, what it could have been used for. And I think a lot of it is sort of us guessing based on what we see in other manuscripts. Um, I don't know, Amy, do you, do you want to say anything more about that? Did uh, I say anything wrong or <laughs> does that all make sense? <laughs> yeah, it does. Only that um, for the, for the localization to Bologna, we're relying on um, Zakur and Hirsch, which is our earlier um, oh, right. mm -hmm. printed catalog of the manuscripts that were here at Penn mm -hmm. up till about 1970. Um, so that is based on their expertise and it might also be related to the style of illumination, um, mm -hmm. um, but we don't have a record of their thinking on that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That's um, one of the things about that I've learned after working in, um, in the library and doing some cataloging work is that oftentimes, you know, a catalog record wasn't necessarily written by one person. It's sort of a person, you know, it, it might be compiled from different sources, different people looking at the manuscripts at different times and then compiled together. And then, <coughs> you know, we, we will, I'll post things on social media and then I'll get, you know, messages from people saying, oh no, look at this and look at this. And then I'll give that to Amy and then Amy will add that to the record. So it's sort of built up over time a lot and you just, yeah. And so sometimes you, 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 you'll get a new book and the, what you get will say it's from this place and you look at it and you'll say, yeah, it looks like that's right. And then you put it in, but you don't really know, is this a dirty secret? Maybe I'm giving away a dirty secret, but this is like, this is like the way the, the way it works. So yeah, let's see. So another thing that was, that I thought was kind of interesting is it feels to me like the, it's the manuscript changes about halfway through. So I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom in down here in the corner. Um, uh, one of the another thing. So we I pointed out the catchwords, but another way that um, I guess binders would note um, how the manuscript is supposed to put together is they would put signatures on the um, on the leaves. So back here, let me see. All right, so here we have the end of a choir. 
And then here is another choir starting and we have a little mark there and then one, two, three, four, five. And I think that's a C, which means A, B, C. So this is going to be the third. And it is because we're on page 20 or leaf number 27, folio 20, um, sorry, 25, folio 25, C, five, uh, one, 10, 20, and then we're on leaf five. And now we're in the middle of the choir. And I'm gonna see if I can show you. There is thread. I don't know if you can see the thread and I don't wanna push it too far, but there is thread in the, in, this, in the thing here. So this is the middle of the choir. And so this is another way that we sort of know they're together. And then in this, in this manuscript, then there's an X here which i think is the binder or i don't think it's the scribe indicating okay now this is this is the middle of the choir and then there's and then we we're going to have one two three three four five and then we have another catchword and look we have another illuminated one of these illuminated initials. And I'm betting this pink, I think it's maybe this pink is the, is, is gonna help you locate because I don't see that. It's very Italian at least, this sort of style of color, but then we're in the middle. And so that's another way that the, that we sort of know how this book is put together. But I noticed we're still only in the first part of the manuscript, but so I'm gonna skip back. So we have our um, our titles at the top. We have all this going on. We have some illuminations. If we go back a little bit further, the pages get a lot more plain. So we still have the um, the little initials. We're gaining, I think, these. No, well, we have them here too. Um, but I wanna see if I can find it because I thought this was weird. We have a different, we definitely have a different scribe here. This is a different um, style of writing. And I just, I know we're almost out of time, but I thought this was so weird. And I wanted to actually to ask Amy if she had seen, what am I looking for? I should have marked it. Well, here's another initial anyway, here. This is, is what I haven't seen before. So we're at the end of another choir and here, there's a little red line there. And if I turn the page, so this is the first leaf of the next choir. And if I turn the page, there's two little lines. And then if I turn the page again, there's three little lines. So this is doing the same thing that the that the numbers down in the far corner were doing earlier in the manuscript, um, but it's it's making these little lines. And I have never ever seen this before in my life. That doesn't mean it it's rare. Even it just means I haven't seen it. I don't know, Amy. Have you seen Have you seen this before? I, and I think this is maybe the only choir where it happens. I haven't, and. Um... And do the signatures, like sometimes people get creative when they have more than 24 uh, signatures in a, in a manuscript, they will mm -hmm. go from Z to double A or asterisk A and start going through the alphabet again. But this isn't a big enough book for that. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering what happens in the signature before and after this oh. one. Let's see. I'm going to. This out. Sorry, we're going a little over time. You all can leave if you want. This is just me and Amy. Um, but I think I think this is such a neat. This is such a neat, uh, such a neat manuscript. So the next one doesn't have. This doesn't have signatures. The next one. So because here's the here's the catchword, right. and then this one doesn't have signatures at all. Um, 
And I'm wondering about this, like if it's the same scribe. So here's this one. Here's the previous, uh, previous one. And where does it start? Ooh, that's 70. So it's gonna start at 61. So here's that. And this one doesn't have signatures either. So it's just that one, it's that one choir that has those little hatch marks. It's pretty elegant, um, but it yeah. wouldn't help you put the book in order. It would uh, not. <laughs> unless there was more to the system that I don't understand, which there probably was. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. So we have a question about, um, James Brigos, are you asking about these lines? These lines here? Um, because they're definitely, these are definitely indicating the page order um, because they start with one and then two and then three and then four and then five. So it's the first five leaves of this, of this choir. Um, yeah, I just haven't seen any. It's, it's neat to be able to show you something. It might not seem very interesting to you, but having not seen something before, I think it's pretty, um, it's pretty neat. So we are actually now well over time. So I'm going to say thank you for joining us and having a look of, with us at this interesting little book. And I hope that we'll uh, see you again next week and in, in future weeks. And um, take care. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.